Hey folks, this is Jessica Mashkovich, host of One Take with Jess. Uh, before I introduce my guest today, I would just like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Kona Benelli, the creator of the Throby, the original wearable blanket, blanket poncho. Um, as a result of your purchases, Kona Benelli donates blankets to shelter dogs nationwide to comfort them as they await a forever home. So go to throby.com to buy all of your holiday gifts that give back. Today's guest on One Take with Jess is Dr. Philip Ovedia. He is a heart surgeon with over 3,000 operations and the author of the book, Stay Off My Operating Table. I'm putting himself out of a job with this one. <laughs> Philip's mission is actually to teach people how to live healthier lives in order to avoid becoming heart surgery patients, which I think is right up everyone's alley, especially with the holidays coming and... Um, People are going to be indulging and then, of course, wanting to pull back and become healthier. Uh, but in chatting with you, we will talk not only health, but we will talk metabolic health, which is slightly different, a little bit more nuanced. And welcome to the podcast. I will stop talking so you can enlighten us on uh, on all that you have to offer in this in this area. Sure thing. <laughs> Great to be here with you, and thank you so much for having me on. Um, you know, as you kind of alluded to, uh, I am not a very good businessman because I am literally looking to put myself out of business, and uh, I want people to understand, you know, what I have learned now in over 20 years as a heart surgeon and my own personal journey to overcome uh, poor health. Uh, I was morbidly obese. I was pre-diabetic. And I realized that I was going to end up on my own operating table, so to speak. And uh, thankfully, um, I started to learn some uh, new concepts around what it takes to be healthy and what it means to be healthy. And I ultimately have come to recognize that the vast majority of what I do every day as a heart surgeon shouldn't be necessary. And I want people to understand that no matter how good a heart surgeon I may be, no matter how good all the heart surgeons out there are, you're always better off if you never needed the heart surgery in the first place. Uh, so uh, looking forward to uh, discussing with you and educating your audience on how you can avoid heart surgery, how you can stay off of my operating table. I mean, this is such a, a huge topic because people are looking to live longer and healthier and be more active and eat better. And I, I say people, but it's not all people. The majority of people take comfort in the comfort food, the processed foods. People are too busy to um, to do what we say, like it, to, to what people say is eating healthy, um, eating whole foods. It, it takes a lot of effort. So people think, but is that the case? And like, are there some, some ways that we can just change our thinking about food and make different choices? Um, you know, we see someone out there that looks thin and we're like, oh, I want to be them. I'll just jump and do more exercise, but I could still go back and eat what I want to eat when I want to eat it. So I think society's all mixed up <laughs> with all of these different messages. Can you help bring a little bit of clarification to some? Yes, getting? definitely. And, you know, I think it's quite sad uh, that, you know, we have come to expect uh, in our society uh, that being unhealthy as you get older is normal. Um, we look all around us and, you know, the statistics show that the majority of people uh, who are over 50 years old are on multiple medications. And we also have statistics showing that 88% of the adults in the United States are not in optimal metabolic health. And we'll get into what exactly that means. Uh, but essentially, it means that nine out of 10 people are sick. And so we have normalized being sick. We have given the message that you don't have to worry about getting sick because that's what the healthcare system is here for. That's what doctors are here for. And we are now at a point where, you know, people spend uh, the last third of their life, uh, in most cases, sick and dealing with their illnesses. And it doesn't need to be that way. It didn't used to be that way. 
Um, and the, the reasons that we got to where we are are because we've been misled about what we should be eating to be healthy. Um, the food pyramid, the U.S. dietary guidelines, which have pushed us to a more processed diet, eating processed food um, for the vast majority of our calories, um, is what has caused us to be sick. And we so can undo that. When you talk about the food pyramid, we're talking for people that aren't familiar with it. It's a lot of carbs on the bottom. Can you describe what the what the food pyramid looks like? Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, which were first released in 1980 and, um, you know, kind of morphed into the food pyramid as the representation of it uh, after that, um, basically uh, says that your diet should be based uh, in grains and carbohydrates. That's the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, fruits and vegetables, which is the next part of the pyramid. Uh, and then uh, lean proteins. So you need to avoid fat is one of the messages in there. Um, and, um, you know, that by nature, you know, the only way to do that is to eat more processed food, because what grows around us naturally, um, the things that grow in the ground and the things that eat the things that grow in the ground, uh, those, those are the things that I tell people they should be eating. Um, those don't fit in well to the pyramid. Uh, so what the pyramid really ended up doing was pushing us to more processed food. And, you know, people will understand this when you walk in a supermarket today, um, it is fine. It is hard to find whole real food. Um, you know, just sort of the perimeter of the typical supermarket is the only place that you find real food. You have your produce section with your fruits and vegetables. You have your meat section. Uh, you have your dairy section. Uh, and these are whole real foods. And the whole middle part of the supermarket, 80, 90% of the supermarket is processed food. It has a long list of ingredients. Most of us don't even know what those ingredients are. Um, it's not something we could just go and make ourselves. And that processed food is what is damaging our health ultimately. Yeah. And, you know, I notice a lot of the processed food also is sometimes fortified with vitamins and minerals, stuff that you probably should be getting by eating more whole foods. Exactly. However, if you're stuffing yourself with the processed foods, they're going to want to make sure that you get some of the, uh, the vitamins and minerals. So why is it that doctors like primary care physicians or your internist isn't leading the charge, um, with, managing your, your body in a holistic way. I mean, I noticed that my, uh, primary care physician is doing things like just checking some vitals and then you're on your way. If you have something going on with your heart or your health or your weight or your lungs or something, it's, here's a, the name of a specialist. And, you know, you hope that they're actually getting a full picture of your body and your health, but it's, it's, few and far between in the healthcare system. What, what, why is that? Why is, and I think back in the day, people had like a, a town doctor or someone that was invested in the community, invested in, you know, knowing people's health and people's behaviors and how they live and what they do. And I think the doctor was more entrenched in the society of the people that they lived in and had a more holistic view of what was going on with people's health back in the day. Yeah. So, you know, many reasons why that has become, but essentially, you know, the medical system has been built around taking care of sick people and doctors are trained to take care of sick people. Uh, we are not trained well on how to keep people from being sick in the first place. And we're also not trained on how once people become sick to seek out the root cause of what made them sick and try and reverse it. Um, the answer from the medical system is usually prescribe a medication or do a procedure. Um, and doctors are educated in that system. They are sort of trapped within that system. Uh, the typical doctor's visit these days, as you said, is 15 minutes long. It's not you know, long enough to dive into things like what are you eating and what are your habits and how are those affecting your health? Um, and so we, you know, most doctors are simply just overwhelmed by taking care of sick people 
and they are not able to step back and say, how can we keep people from getting sick in the first place? Mm -hmm. Do you think that doctors have faith in their patients that if they do take the time to talk about health and diet and fitness, that the patients will actually heed the advice or are, do people just, are they just succumbing to, you know, their desires and eating what they want to eat because it's more convenient to our doctors kind of like knowing that and they, they need to prescribe a pill because they know it's going to be easier for the patient to do that. Yeah. So, you know, doctors do oftentimes make those assumptions. They, they say that diet and lifestyle doesn't work. Um, the patients won't follow our advice. Uh, and, you know, giving a pill is certainly easier. Writing that prescription is certainly easier. Um, my experience is different. Um, you know, now that I have these conversations with people and I tell them, you know, you basically have two options. You've been diagnosed, let's say, with type 2 diabetes. And you can take, a, you know, I can start you on a medication that's going to, you know, somewhat reverse the effects of type 2 diabetes. It's going to bring your blood sugar levels down. We know that over time, you're going to need more and more medications. And ultimately, you're going to start to get complications from this disease. Um, or option B is we can change what you eat and change some of your habits. And you won't need the medications. You can reverse this disease. Type 2 diabetes is a reversible disease. Um, most patients, when given that option, are going to choose the latter. They're going to say, show me what to eat. Um, the added bonus for this is, you know, most patients are thinking, oh, I got to eat some miserable diet. And, you know, I'm now able to tell them, no, you can eat, you know, delicious food all the time. You know, you can eat as much as you're going to want to eat. Uh, because we're going to retrain your body to actually know when it's hungry and when it's not hungry. And, you know, you're going to enjoy a great life. Uh, you're going to feel your best every day, as the subtitle of my book says. Um, and it's very doable. Uh, and again, when given that option, most patients are going to choose that option. But most patients are not given that option. The doctors tell them, because the doctors have been educated, that the only answer is to take the medication. So what are some of the myths that we've been told, um, for example, with red meats or with oils or fats, um, yeah. these are things where on, on some of the diet plans, you need to stay away from, like you mentioned before, lean meats and, you know, fats are at the top of the pyramid to have them sparingly. But, um, talk to me about why these are myths at this time. Yeah. So, you know, I would say kind of one of the, the, the biggest myth that probably underlies a lot of everything else was that, you know, saturated fat uh, that occurs in animal products primarily um, is driving our health problems. And it's simply not true. Um, you know, there there's a fairly uh, sordid history of how that uh, myth got propagated at first. You know, it was like everything else in, in medicine, it was a hypothesis. It was a theory. And uh, there were really two prevailing theories when uh, we go back to the 1950s about what was causing the rising incidence of heart disease. And uh, for various reasons, you know, the saturated fat uh, myth, uh, the saturated fat hypothesis, I guess I should say, got advanced. And um, it really got accepted as gospel without good proof that it was true. And it is what led us ultimately down this whole pathway and led to the US dietary guidelines and led to low fat diets. And again, the only way to construct a low fat diet is to process the food, take the fat out of it. And then you have to substitute in basically sugar and carbohydrates uh, to, to make that processed food palatable. And here we are, you know, 70 years later, after this advice was first given, and our health has only worsened. Uh, so it's time for us to step back and re-examine, you know, where did we go wrong? Uh, and I go back to that, you know, that kind of fork in the road, that decision point that, um, you know, saturated fat was harmful for our health. 
So you have people going to the levels of keto where they're putting butter in their coffee and making these fat bombs or whatever they're called, which is basically butter and cream cheese and, and fat and fat and fat, and then more uh, dirty keto as they call it, where it's like chopped meat that's high in fat. Is there is there too much of going to the other side of that? And I know that part of keto is to reduce your carbs down to minimum. Yeah. Um, and people lose weight. So in some of these diets, the, the scale basically is tipped. And then sometimes people do get into better health, according to, you know, what they say, in pursuing these high fat diets. Is that something that's healthy? Yeah. So the ketogenic diet uh, can be uh, a good way to improve health. Um, you know, I always caution, though, that, you know, like everything, and I go through this in the book, you know, I go through a number of popular diet plans, like the ketogenic diet, and I talk about what can be good about them and what can be bad about them. So, you know, again, a lot of processed food is out there that's labeled keto these days. And so people assume it's healthy for them, but it's still processed food. It is not healthy for them. Um, and so, yes, ketogenic diets can be beneficial, as can many other types of diet plans. Um, but the real central uh, theme in a healthy diet uh, needs to be eating whole real food. Okay. Yeah, that is that is the theme. What's up? Can we pause for a second? Yeah. Take a call. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you're, you're muted. And we're back. <laughs> um, okay. So um, I'd love to talk about, because I, I just realized we didn't define what metabolic health is. So if yeah, you, definitely. Yeah. Take that. Um, and then I'd love to talk about more food and exercise and uh, overall wellness. Yeah. So metabolic health is a concept uh, that quite frankly, most doctors don't understand and therefore they're not able to educate their patients on. And the way that I explain it in its most simplest uh, you know, uh, way is that metabolic health, when you are metabolically healthy, your body is properly utilizing the inputs that you are giving it. And the primary input we give our bodies is the food that we eat. When we eat, uh, one of three things happens to that food. Um, and these three things need to be in proper balance. So some of that food gets turned into immediate energy to be used, you know, for all of the processes that are going on throughout in your body throughout the day. Some of that food gets broken down and is used to build and rebuild our tissues, another process that's always going on within us. And then some of that food is supposed to be turned into energy for storage for times when food is not available. And what has happened uh, in the modern environment, and again, what the processed foods um, artificially force our body to do is basically store too much energy. And that ends up leading to a whole host of downstream problems. Uh, so, you know, being in poor metabolic health basically means, you know, the food that you are eating, your body is no longer properly processing that and properly partitioning it amongst those three uh, options. How does one know, how can you measure if you are in good metabolic health or not? Yeah. So there were five basic measures that we use to assess someone's, poor, uh, someone's metabolic health. Um, and when I referred earlier to that study that showed that 88% of adults are not metabolically healthy, it was based on these five criteria. So only 12% of the adults in the United States were able to meet all five of these healthy criteria. Um, Let's see first, how many I meet. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll find out. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, the first criteria is uh, something you can measure at home. It's your waist circumference. So you just take a tape measure. Uh, you want to measure just above the level of your belly button. And it's best to do this first thing in the morning. And if you were a man, you want that measurement to be less than 40 inches. If you were a woman, you want it to be less than 35 inches. 
The next uh, measurement, uh, again, you can check it at home. Um, it's your blood pressure. You know, you can also check it at almost any pharmacy or grocery store these days. And pretty much every time you go and see your doctor, they're going to check it for you. And you need, you want your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 85. So both of those numbers need to be, you know, under 130 and under 85. And that needs to be without the use of any medications. If you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure and you've been prescribed medication to lower your blood pressure, that is an indicator that you are not metabolically healthy. Hmm. The final three numbers are going to come from some blood work. And this is real basic blood work that almost every physician checks with their you know, routine physicals. Uh, here in the United States, there are many websites you can go to and order it, you know, order the blood work yourself. Um, so you want to look at your fasting blood glucose level, and that's the amount of sugar that's in your blood uh, when you haven't eaten for eight to 12 hours. You want that number to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And again, that should be without the use of medications. Type 2 diabetes is a hallmark of poor metabolic health. And then we're going to look at your cholesterol panel, but we're not going to look at it. The number that most doctors focus on, on that panel is your LDL, your low density lipoprotein, your so-called bad cholesterol. Um, that is not a marker of metabolic health. Um, the other two numbers on that panel are markers of metabolic health. So your HDL cholesterol, nicknamed good cholesterol, and we actually want more of this, which is confusing to people. You want this to be higher. Um, specifically, if you're a woman, you want it to be over 50 milligrams per deciliter. If you're a man, you want it to be over 40 milligrams per deciliter. And finally, we're going to look at your triglyceride level, another number on the cholesterol panel, and you want this to be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And so I know that was a lot... A lot to take in. Um, people can actually go to my website, ifixhearts.com. Right there on the front page, there's a quiz that's basically going to march you through those measurements so you can find out if you're metabolically healthy or not. Yes. And, you know, I always tell people when you're at the doctor's office, you have to ask them questions. Some people just go in and they do whatever the doctor says, and the doctor says you're fine. And then they make their copay and leave. But when, when I go in, I know what blood panels I'd like the doctor to run. Um, I ask for some extra here and there, like vitamin, mineral, whatever that panel is called to see if I'm low in vitamin D to see if, you know, and I do this with my kids as well. And when my blood pressure is taken, I always ask what it was because a lot of times the doctor won't even tell you what it was, or the person taking your blood pressure will always say the doctor will discuss it with you when he comes in or when she comes in. Um, but it, you do have to kind of take hold of your own health when it comes to asking the doctor for what you are there for. And you have to know what you're there for before you go in, in order to get the full picture of what you want to see. Um, my, one of my cholesterol numbers did come back high. It was not the, the happy cholesterol, the HDL, the happy, um, it was, it was the bad one. It was that, and, and I was told to just go easy on the cheese. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know how, you know, I love cheese. I'm probably not going to go easy on the cheese, but you know, other diet and, uh, exercise components could have been added to that as well, but we do need to take hold of our own health. Yeah. And, and the, the cholesterol topic is a whole nother, uh, you know, rabbit hole that we could certainly go down. Uh, but you know, your, your message is exactly correct. And it is one that I, you know, enforce to people all the time, uh, that you need to take control of your health. You are in charge of your health. Um, your doctor is not in charge of making you healthy. Uh, they're not going to make you healthy. Uh, you need to, you know, make this a priority in your life. And it really should be um, your biggest priority in life. You know, one of my, uh, one of the sayings that I often repeat is that, you know, a healthy person has a thousand wishes, a sick person only has one. Um, and, you know, it, if you're not healthy, really, you know, most of 
the re- you know, everything else that's going on in your life is not going to uh, matter and is going to be diminished if you are not healthy. Yes, very true. Um, so those were great markers that people can measure themselves to find out if they're metabolically healthy. Can you tell if someone is healthy by just looking at them or is there, cause I heard there's something called skinny fat or. Exactly. So you really can't tell just by looking, you know, the statistics, that same study that I talked about earlier, that 88% are unhealthy when they specifically looked at the uh, people who were normal weight uh, in that study, 50% of them were still unhealthy, you know, metabolically unhealthy. So while being overweight, being obese certainly makes it more likely that you are not metabolically healthy, you can't assume that you're metabolically healthy just because you're normal weight. Yeah. Um, that's a good point. And those markers will definitely open, un, open up the hood to find out what really is your metabolic health. Um, what about women over 50 who basically say that their metabolism is slowing down or women that are struggling with, um, diet and exercise. And I'm using women here because I'm a woman. So I'm, I'm yeah. in that group of people. Um, and, and a lot of times it's, uh, oh, it must be a thyroid issue or it must be, uh, just, uh, what is it caused called hormonal belly hormonal, or met- yeah. menopause belly yeah. or some of that is, is there any truth to any of those? Well, so, you know, the, the truth is it, that, you know, as women approach menopause, they are more likely to become metabolically unhealthy because of the influence of some of these hormones. Um, but first and foremost, you know, you need to be looking at your metabolic health. Uh, you know, the whole message of, you know, you just need to be exercising more um, is really, you know, not helpful. Uh, you can't out exercise a bad diet. So you really should be stepping back, looking primarily at the food that you were eating. And, you know, what I generally find is that women who are metabolically healthy um, have an easier time, you know, going through menopause and they don't uh, seem to suffer as much from the hormonal effects uh, from all of that. Um, But, you know, women's physiology is distinct, is unique for men. Uh, so again, your doctor needs to recognize that needs to understand that. And, uh, you know, some of the things that work for men, uh, very well, like, uh, you know, may not work as well for women. And, uh, it can become kind of tricky to untangle the whole, uh, you know, situation, especially around menopause when you have these shifts in your, uh, hormones. Um, but it's not a, uh, you know, we shouldn't accept it as an inevitable problem. Um, it is a sign that something else, you know, is going on. And that is usually something with your metabolic health. And so when you focus on your metabolic health, uh, many women report that, you know, their menopausal symptoms get better. Yeah. Um, so if you're eating whole foods and if you're looking to exit, Just a sec. Good. Okay. (laughs) Um, Take two. So if you are eating whole foods and um, wait a second, I'll, I'll cut this part out because I forgot what my question was. My son just came home from Penn state. Hang on. No problem. Okay. Take three. So if we are eating, a, a, I don't even want to call it a heart healthy diet because that is the wrong diet. This is a metabolically healthy whole foods, uh, lifestyle that people should be pursuing, um, and incorporating uh, proper exercise. What, what is, what, what's another myth that we've been taught about exercise? Cause if I eat poorly and have the whole chicken Parmesan with the spaghetti on the side, 
I feel like I can just walk or run for three hours the next day to burn it off. Um, yeah, how does so cardio fit into the picture here with trying to reverse what we've done with our poor eating choices? Yeah. So again, this message of uh, sort of balancing what you do with what you eat is is a myth, is a lie. Uh, and it's really propagated by the food industry uh, to give them the excuse that they can keep selling this processed food. Um, it's not that cardio is not good for you. Um, there are certainly benefits to doing cardio, uh, but it's not uh, going to overcome the effects of a poor diet. Um, and so, uh, we need to, uh, recognize that, you know, um, I discuss, you know, again, in the book that activity is one of the pillars of metabolic health. Um, and for most people, you do want to be getting more activity. Um, I also, you know, try to educate people that, muscle building activities and muscle maintaining activities, resistance exercise um, is more beneficial in the long run uh, than cardio is by itself. Uh, but ultimately, you know, if you're not getting the what you eat part right, you're really not going to be able to compensate for that just by doing more activity. So interesting. Like, you should choose a handful of whole nuts instead of flaming Cheetos. And you should probably lift heavy things and put them down, <laughs> push and pull lots of heavy things in order to build muscle instead of um, spending an hour on the treadmill. Um, there was, there was something in your book that talked about a burst of exercise, uh, like high heart rate is just as beneficial as like a two hour run or, um, I'm totally getting that wrong. So please correct that and talk about that because people are less apt to go running for two hours and possibly more apt to do something as a burst of energy to help themselves. I'm trying to think of like the path to least yeah. resistant and the low hanging fruit when it comes to, to people, uh, getting in better metabolic health. Yeah. So when it comes to activity and improving your metabolic health, as I said, you know, your priority, your first priority should be building and maintaining muscle. Um, we know that the better you are able to maintain muscle as you get older, uh, not only the longer you live, but the better quality of life you will have. So that is always priority number one when I'm working with people and thinking about, you know, their activities. When you then start to look at cardio, uh, you know, type activities, um, some of it's going to depend on what your goals are. But in general, if we're specifically looking at metabolic health, um, you're going to get more bang for your buck with the sort of high intensity exercises, um, you know, things like sprints as opposed to a jog. And, you know, obviously you're going to do those for shorter periods of time. Uh, so your exercise sessions become more efficient and they specifically target, um, you know, what we call visceral fat, which is sort of the fat on the inside around your organs that underpins a lot of these metabolic health problems. Um, you know, cardio in the sense of, you know, running on the treadmill for hours at a time or, you know, going for long uh, runs is useful for training your body to do those sort of activities. Um, and yes, it does, you know, burn more calories than standing still ultimately. It does have some benefit, uh, but you know, most people's limitations are on their time. So if you're looking to do this in the most efficient way, um, you know, what I tell people to do is first, you know, do resistance exercise, build some muscle, and then, you know, maybe do some high intensity intervals of, uh, you know, a cardio activity. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. And as I'm getting older, uh, there's the statistic that you're just constantly losing muscle. Um, and it's, it's a goal just to maintain muscle. And if you fall, you're going to want to be able to get up, um, right. and, and just to be able to hold yourself up. A lot of people start having back problems, uh, not because they're back is giving out, but it's the, the muscles all around your back, your core 
um, is, is working less. Everything needs to work in tandem. So I'm, I'm a big, uh, proponent of the whole, um, strength training side of things. I'm getting more into that myself at this time. Um, talk to me a little bit about oils and fats. I remember my grandmother used to always use Fleischmann's margarine, <laughs> which I think is made of plastic. I, <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not good, but that was what women did back in the fifties yep. um, to keep slender. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you're right. It's not far from plastic. Uh, you know, the stuff that is in, uh, margarine, um, you know, so again, as I alluded to earlier, you know, this whole myth that saturated fat in particular was bad for us. And therefore we had to eat foods that were lower in saturated fat which led to the development of um, processed uh, oils, vegetable and seed oils. These are not things that occur naturally. Uh, you know, they, they are called, it's interesting, they call them vegetable oils so that people will think, oh, vegetables, they must be healthy. Um, and the reality is, is that most of them don't even come from vegetables. Uh, the ones that do are so heavily removed, so heavily processed, uh, the industrial process that it takes to make these vegetable and seed oils uh, is really quite alarming. And it, the reality is, is that they have no benefit for our health. Uh, they are harmful for our health. So and, what are they? They're corn oils? Yeah, and... canola oil, soy, soybean oil, safflower oil. Um, you know, basically um, the, 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 the fats that I tell people are good to eat or healthy are your natural animal fats. So these are going to be things like, um, you know, tallow, which is beef fat, uh, lard, which is uh, pork fat, uh, the animal, you know, dairy uh, fats like butter and ghee, uh, and then your what are called fruit oils. So these are fruits that these are oils that actually come from the fruit itself. So this is olive oil, uh, this is coconut oil, and this is avocado oil are the most common ones. And really, you know, those are the fats that we should be consuming. Those are the fats that we should be using uh, to cook with. And all of these other processed, you know, seed and vegetable oils uh, need to be avoided. Uh, the unfortunate thing that I now tell my patients is that if it says heart healthy on the label, it is not heart healthy. Um, ah, that's just know, a marketing because, campaign nowadays, huh? Yeah. And it, again, it's just one of these um, interactions, I'll say, between the food industry and, you know, healthcare uh, that, um, you know, we, they're really, the whole system has become around pushing these processed foods, which are profitable for the food industry, but they are horrible for our health. Yeah, I mean, when you when you look under the covers of the whole lobbyist groups for for different food uh, industries, it becomes really disturbing how a lot of policy has been shaped by um, lobbyists and yeah. and politics and people that aren't invested in health but more invested uh, in the business side of things. Yeah. And, and, you know, you look at the American Heart Association, which is, you know, the organization that is supposedly out there looking after all of our heart health. And their two biggest funding sources are the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so you really have to question, you know, uh, the, as the saying goes, you know, follow the money and uh, you can start to see how some of these recommendations that are made get influenced. Yeah. And, and that's so disturbing to know that the pharmaceutical industry is doing stuff that's counterintuitive to people's health. You would think that if they were more supportive of proactive health, I know that a lot of things aren't covered under insurances, a nutritionist, um, the gym, you know, like facilities that are helping people improve their health um, in a preventative way are not covered by health insurance, but they could be saving so much money down the road by not having to treat someone or not having to, you know, bear the cost of treating someone that has diabetes or that needs to be on your operating table. I'm sure that that's not a cheap endeavor for someone to 
grace, you know, your presence in the operating room. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that kind of leads to another myth that, uh, you know, most people have a mis, you know, misconception uh, that it's too expensive to eat, you know, whole real food. Um, and the reality is, you know, I, I tell people, you know, you need to look not just at the cost, you know, what that food actually costs when you're buying it. Uh, you need to look at the long-term costs of, you know, if this food is ultimately making you sick and down the line is going to lead to you having all these health problems, that is very expensive, you know, in terms of dollars, uh, as well as, of course, in terms of, you know, the loss of quality of life. Um, so, you know, it turns out that eating whole real food is really less expensive in the long run, because when you eat whole real food, you are hungry less often, you end up eating less often. And uh, ultimately, you know, you can eat whole real food, you can eat in a metabolically healthy way, uh, very affordably. Absolutely. If you do like a shopping list comparison, you can tell that a bag of flaming Cheetos, I'm using those again, you know, somebody should, I should not because I'm throwing them under the bus, you know, that could be $5 for a bag of Cheetos. And then a bag of apples can also be $5. And you can have six apples that you're munching on, you know, throughout a two day period. And the bag of Cheetos is gone. So, you know, as far as the cost of unhealthy food, that's pretty expensive as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, people definitely need to revisit that and do some comparisons with their shopping list. Um, but so what what about sleep? We always hear that people need more sleep. You should get better rest and that'll be good for your health. How does that how does that work its way into health? And is all sleep the same? Um, yeah, so sleep is another important component of health, and we know that you know sleep and metabolic health uh, interact uh, in both directions. Uh, so if you're not getting enough sleep and you're not getting enough good quality sleep, um, which is important, uh, then you are more likely to be metabolically unhealthy. When you are metabolically unhealthy, it is also going to negatively impact your sleep. So it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. Uh, so yes, sleep is very important. Um, and again, it's not only the amount of sleep that you get, the number of hours, it is the quality of that sleep uh, that ultimately is going to you know, impact your health. So when you say quality of sleep, there's different cycles in sleep. And I wear an Apple watch and I'm constantly yeah. looking in the morning to see how I slept because sometimes I'll, I'll awake and I won't feel rested. But my watch told me that I actually got two hours of deep sleep, which to me was good, or I got no deep sleep. And sometimes it's because I had a little too much wine the night before and yep. my heart rate was not able to come down and I was not able to be in a restful state. So I know that even if I woke up, okay, I know my body was not fixing itself and doing its job. So what things can we avoid, um, in order to optimize that deep sleep, uh, side of things? Yeah. So, uh, one that you mentioned, uh, certainly, you know, drinking alcohol too too close, uh, especially to when you're going to sleep, uh, is a big problem. Um, you know, while some people certainly perceive that, you know, alcohol makes you sleepy, uh, the problem is that you don't get into that deep sleep, as you said, uh, caffeine, obviously too close to sleep is also going to be a problem. And honestly eating, especially eating carbohydrates, heavily processed carbohydrates, uh, too close to sleep are going to interfere with your sleep. Um, other things to be paying attention to are, you know, is your room dark enough? Are you staring at screens, you know, right before you go to bed? Uh, you know, do you have a good sleep environment? Uh, these are all things to be paying attention to uh, when it comes to your sleep. Yeah. One thing that I do often also is, um, being when my kids were young, I'd have the two kids there and my husband, and we'd have nighttime routines, TV watching and, and all of this stuff. But I set a, a sleep reminder on my phone. And I think it was around nine o'clock where my phone would basically, you know, give me the alert and tell me that it was bedtime. 
So I would basically show my family and say, I'm out, <laughs> I'm done, I'm heading upstairs. And it gave me permission to check out and and go do what I needed to do in order to get a restful sleep. So I, I think sometimes, you know, stress of family and, and pressure of jobs and feeling the need to be there with people, um, whether it's a late night out or whether it's just a regular evening with your family, you, you feel guilty for have, for leaving their presence. So I used my phone as my accountability buddy to basically give me the reason and justification for leaving the room to actually go and pursue a good night's sleep. Yeah. And, you know, uh, this basically applies to all the topics that we've talked about, you know, whether it's what you're eating, what activities you're doing, you know, how you're, uh, you know, sleeping. Um, the real first key step here is being intentional about this, is thinking about it, uh, putting effort into it. Because if you're just going through life sort of passively and you're just doing what everyone else around you is doing, um, there's no reason to expect that you're going to get a different result than everyone around you. And as I said, the result right now is everyone around us essentially is sick. Uh, so if you want to avoid that, if you want to be different, uh, first and foremost, you have to make the decision that you're going to put effort into these things. You're going to invest your resources, your time into making yourself more healthy. Yeah. And you're worth it. You're worth it. Because once you get older, that's when you really want to cling to life. <laughs> I noticed that as you get older, you're like, no, I want to live forever. I want to see grandchildren and, and all this stuff. And thinking about it when you're young, younger, um, you're just there to enjoy life. But I think that uh, that thinking definitely needs to start happening way earlier. And, and I think that we're doing a good job. I know my daughter is 18 and she's all about the macros and at the gym and making sure that she's, you know, being healthy. Um, and I'm all about blood work just to check inside and make sure that my kids and my family are healthy as well. So I, I'm glad that you took the time to chat with me. I hope that this, um, you know, was good learning material for, for anyone who's listening or watching, um, and, and can make adjustments, any bit of adjustments uh, in their life, substitutions, or just get out more or walk more, just be more conscious, more, more involved in their own health. So where can people find you? Um, on Twitter, you are at ifixhearts. Is that your website as well? ifixhearts.com? Yes, it is. I, I fix hearts is, is the way to find me. Um, at ifixhearts.com, you can find out, you know, all of the various ways that I work with people. Um, I have the book. Uh, I have a coaching program where you can work with the expert coaches, you know, from my team uh, to learn how to improve your health. We have a number of courses available there that people can take. And then I do have my private um, telemedicine practice. I work with patients throughout the United States. Uh, to really, you know, hone in on their health and improve their health and keep them off of my operating table. And uh, you can find all that information at iFix Hearts. Yes. And your book is called Stay Off My Operating Table, uh, available at all bookstores. And you know what? Listen up, people. He's given it away for free here. He, uh, you were, you've been on a lot of podcasts, a lot of shows. Um, I heard you on the Pomp podcast, Anthony Anthony Pompliano, who I listen to often, and uh, you're working your way around to get the word out. And you know, all of this stuff is doable, and you are basically giving it away for free at the expense of these people not showing up on your operating table, which was your bread and butter. You spent a lot of time learning how to do this. Um, so I guess you'll have to continue saving lives. Uh, until people really listen up and and do what you're saying. So I thank you for, you know, continuing this and and making a career out of uh, the other aspect of metabolic health. Yeah, thank you for having me on, Jess. All righty, I will. Uh, I'll see you on Twitter, and um, we'll chat more often. Because I'm very not sure good. I scored very well on all of those <laughs> scores. <laughs> we'll have to work on that together then. I think so. <laughs> All righty. Go have a good evening and thanks for hopping onto the podcast. Take Thank care. Thank you.